What are some incorrect ways people think about God? That's what we're going to talk about today. The Bible tells us Jesus came to do three things. He came to have my past forgiven, you get a purpose for living, and a home in heaven. Rick Warren. Today we're going to talk about an interesting book called Your God is Too Small, A Guide for Believers and Skeptics Alike by J.B. Phillips. So J.B. Phillips was a Bible translator and wrote this book in 1953. But I thought what was so intriguing about it was it's so relevant today. This book interested me because the first half of the book, which we'll talk about today, talks about how our image of God puts him in a corner, makes him too small. And we'll go through the various places. But in fact, that God is about so much more than oftentimes we think about him. And even he says at the beginning, quote, the trouble with many people today is that they have not found a God big enough for the modern needs. Their experience of life has grown in a score of directions. And in the later quote says, many men and women are living today often with inner dissatisfaction without any faith in God at all. Our understanding of God is very limited. And I, like I said, as a non-Christian, you tend to have the wrong image of what God wants, what Jesus is entirely. And even among people, I think, who went to Sunday school, got a Sunday school education, maybe even sits in the pulpit every week, it's not enough to teach people about the immensity of God. We hear the story of this and the story of that and this particular point, and that we shouldn't worry, and they're all good messages. But at any point, do we get this infinite vision of God? I find it wild, just personally, that this creator who made all of life, made all of us, all the planets, everything in the universe, hears us as individual people, knew us in our mother's wombs, understand and loves us today, and wants us to follow him so we can follow him right into the kingdom of heaven. That is something staggering. I mean, I think no human being can pr really see that image because it's so immense. And that's what this book really talks about. So like I said, we're going to talk about some incorrect images of what God is. And then next week, we'll talk about more correct images of what God is. And he says that a lot of this has to do with the fact that our minds aren't big enough to account for everything. We can't even think of it. We can't even think of the immensity of all of it because it is just too large. So he said that he wants to expose us to exactly what God really is about. In some cases, we think about God, he says, as a resident policeman, meaning that we hope that he enforces our rules, you know, that we have this idea of right and wrong. And God is going to take all those people who are wrong and tell them what for. He's the great rule maker in the sky. I think that history is just filled with that. How many movies, and again, movies aren't real, but, you know, they're based on history things where you would have a king or a high up person in the church and say, well, you did wrong and therefore God hates you. And so I'm condemning you. And they would throw that person into prison condemn that person to go to hell when this person had no right to do it. So thinking about God as your own police force, no. He says sometimes that our image of God has to do what, with what he calls parental hangover, meaning these fearful ideas, these images we have of our parents carries over to our image of God. If we were afraid of our parents, our parents were harsh with us, maybe we think of God as being harsh. If our parents were not loving, maybe we don't see God as loving. I think at times it's hard for me to realize that God is involved in our personal lives and cares about the small things in our lives, maybe because sometimes I didn't feel like the small things in my life were cared for. Whatever image we have of our own growing up and our parents sometimes leaks over into God. It is only the mature Christian, I mean, and women, you know, think women, who can begin to see a little of the size of his father. He says, quote, but his growing maturity a person who looks at God as his parent, he is likely to see that Christ, in his kindness of his heart, has certainly not exaggerated the awe-inspiring disparity between man and God. 
that as we grow and mature, we can't just put the image of our parents on top of God. So sometimes we look at God as the grand old man. He's just some white fluffy beard guy sitting on a throne. He can't possibly understand what is going on. He's old, ancient. We have computers now. Did he know that we were going to have computers? Even if there was a God, he can't speak to what we're facing today. And that's another bad image of God. Of course, he knows what we're going on today. He was able to transcend different time periods, even in the Bible. When you're talking about Noah, you're talking about Abraham, you're talking about the patriarch fathers, he changed along with them and he changes along with us too. Of course, God understands computers and what we're facing. It is easy for us to just have this, oh, childish view of a white bearded God in heaven not understanding anything that we're going through. That's really unfortunate. The next one is that God demands absolute perfection from us. He sent his son because we can't achieve it. He says, quote, God is truly perfection, but he's no perfectionist. He sent his son because we could not achieve perfection. One perfect man. The next one is, he says, the heavenly bosom. <laughs> There's a 1953 word for you. But that God, because we, you know, again, have this childish, he called it regression, where we want to just snuggle in escapism into God. And sometimes we need that, right? Sometimes we need the God who hugs us with love, who wants us to understand. Like I said, you want to feel hugged by God, read Max Lucado. But it's not just about pure escapism. God will hug us. God will comfort us. But we can't live in that comforting. He calls us to come out of there and start doing his work, following him. And he says that if we spend too much time there, it encourages us, it encourages other people to have this childish requirement of nurturing, of, he called it even evading responsibility. We see people, you know, are very fragile today. God wants you to know he loves you, but he also wants you to stand up and start doing the will of God. Paul didn't sit forever on that road to Damascus, weeping and kneeling before God. He got up and he did things. He says, God in the box. That is another type of God that is, he says, nonsense, arrogance, that if there's a God, that God is this particular type of box. And that if we do X, Y, and Z, we can have this God available to us. But instead, God made it clear, we don't have to jump through hoops. We don't have to do X, Y, and Z. We just have to come to God, beg for mercy, and be with him. That these institutions of man make all these hoops and make all these, you know, mechanisms for us to come to God. And that is not what God is about. We don't have to believe in a certain church. We don't have to go in a certain pattern. And remember, the the criminal on the cross next to Jesus was going to be with Jesus in heaven the next day. He didn't jump through any hoops. He didn't go to a particular denomination. He didn't have to go through a gatekeeper. God is available to us all. And we have to make sure that everyone understands that, that there's no magic tradition, conviction, he says. There's honest differences that divide us, but that does not mean that you have to believe in this one church or go to this one thing or say these one magic words. We just got through that in Acts. God transcends all of this and wants us to come to him. Another image we have of God is the managing director. He's sitting in heaven and he's making all these details happen, making sure the earth revolves around the sun and the sun revolves around the galaxy and the galaxy revolves around the universe. And he is the one who is in charge of everything. And so for him to sit there and be interested in my little tiny life, that he cares about little old me when he is trying to run the entire universe. That's not God at all. He told us to come to him. He told us to pray to him. He made us in his image, but that's not enough. We have to realize that God is not a manager, that he is not our boss in in this sense of mankind. Instead, He wants us, big and small, to come to him all the time. He says, quote, we need a God with the capacity to hold, so to speak, both big and small in his mind at the same time. He says next that we shouldn't believe in God as a second-hand God. 
got into a very complicated thing, but looking at God as other people, like movies and films and books look at God, that they try to create God as someone who ignores all of the things that God said, that God is this very fluffy sort of concept, that it's this fictitious thing that charms people, that brings people together, that helps you find your true love in movies. And, and then most of the time it is ignoring the true message of God or ignoring God at all, that there is just a kismet in the world trying to bring together people, a spirit of the universe. And so our lesson from these other things teach us that God is not personal, that God doesn't expect things from us, that God didn't create the scriptures for us. It ignores the entire scriptural reason for it. And you might even see where God rewards people for their lust, he says, or for their meanness or for their pride. Or, you know, you even see um, God doing something vindictive against someone we don't like in a movie. That's not it either. He says that sometimes in these movies and books, it's willful that they're trying to hold up this mirror in life and giving the impression that God is horrible, that there's a grudge against the church or against people. And that's probably whoever is making the movie and the book or whatever it is that's being presented to us, a bigotry of that person. They maybe didn't like their clergy. They didn't like their church. They didn't like their religious parents. And so now Christians are hypocrites. Pastors and priests are terrible. And the church itself is completely wrong. And maybe there's no God at all in this book or this movie. But maybe there is, and it's not anything related to any kind of religion. So we get our image of God from these works of fiction where people are really trying to work out their own grudges. That's kind of interesting. Then there's the image of God that he has bad images of it, that he's always disappointed us. He's always mad at us. He's always let down by us, that we never can do anything right. And that God is sitting in heaven going, oh, Jill. And making him the bad guy in the story of judging us all the time and airing these grievances out. Well, you know, Jill, I would have helped you with this, but look at all the disappointing and awful things you do. God loves us, cares for us, and cares for us as we are as people. Of course, he doesn't want us to sin, but he is there to hold our hand, to help us. The Holy Spirit he sent to help us with our sin. God isn't just sitting there wondering what bad thing you're going to do next. He says in the end that God gave us this power to choose our own life, which means that sometimes we don't choose the path that God gave to us. We may think that was risky. You should have not let us have free will because, look, I make bad choices all the time. But instead, we should look at what God has done, the types of people he created. And I think we're going to see that fulfilled in heaven. We are going to become the people we should have always been. But that's what God wanted out of us is he wanted us to come to him of our own free wills, not be robots. And instead of him being disappointed in us all the time, he is waiting for us to follow him. And we're going to just do amazing things in heaven together. He says that God sometimes has this image of what he calls the pale Galilean, which means that he's just a gentle voice. He was sort of a wispy man walking through the desert speaking these truths, and, and that God is here. He says something is interesting how he said it, to drain out all vitality in life and all color, that there's some sort of a masochistic joy of crushing us with this negativism. And as Jesus walks around, it's just like, oh, don't have joy. Don't have a great life. You know, don't have all the things that God has given us. Instead, it's this very negative God who knows our hearts and then just is like, no, oh, so disappointed in you. Instead, it, he says he calls this very unattractive and unpleasant. That, And it happens too often with religious people. I mean, I think, again, we've seen this in history where people think that if you're having fun, you're not worshiping God. And he says, quote, Dare they defy and break away from this imaginary God with the perpetual frown and find the one who is great positive, who gives life, courage, joy, and wants his sons and daughters to stand on their own two feet. Boy, that's a, that's a fantastic image. 
And then the last one on the negative side is he says that God can oftentimes be a projected image, which means that we magnify our own good qualities. So as compared to the police officer where we hope God just goes out and arrests everyone we disagree with. In this case, I happen to be particularly good at X, Y, and Z. Maybe I'm very good in my moral life. You know, I don't sleep around and I don't steal money. And so God is clearly a projection of all the very good things I am. And we are just really propping ourselves up in our own image to be God. And that's not what he wants us to do even. He says it's narcissistic that we think of the best qualities we have. That must be what God represents. Oh, not the things I'm really bad at, you know, like following him, like sharing the word of God. No, 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 no. God is good at the things I'm good at. And that's kind of a funny thing. And then he says there's sort of an assortment of bad images we have of God. God who is in a hurry. He's always busy. He's out there doing the king's business, rushing, 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 anxiety, pressure, evangelize, go do this, go do that. Instead, he says, quote, it's refreshing and salutary to study the pros and quietness of Christ. His tasks and responsibilities might well have driven a man out of his mind, but he was never in a hurry, never impressed by numbers, never a slave to the clock, never in a hurry. And you see that, right? Jesus took time to pray when action was happening. People were chasing him. We just fed the 5,000 people, and Jesus goes and retreats in to pray. John the Baptist was killed, and Jesus goes off to pray. He spends time with the disciples. So I thought that was really great. That God is just for the elite, you know, that the people who are privileged, I think even in power, like kings and queens and presidents, you know, he's just for them. God's on my side, that he never went for the privileged class. He went to everybody. He went to all brethren, everyone to be his followers. The next one is God of Bethel. Bethel means um, house of God in Hebrew. But he said the people at Bethel sort of see God as a contract. If I do X, Y, and Z, then God will do A, B, and C for me. That it's a if-then kind of statement when it comes to God. If I only do the Ten Commandments, then God will reward me. And we see a lot of that today, that if you just did all these things, God would make you rich. God would make you healthy. God would do these amazing things in your life. And then he says that makes everything cut and dry and the gospel is reduced. When he talked to people, he said, it has been said, but I say to you, he's a God of of living people, not just this sort of rule-based thing. Or God without the Godhead, which means depersonalized, just sort of the ultimate you know, value. You see that with people will say, well, God just wants love or he just wants me to be kind. He just wants me to be this or he wants me to be that. That whatever it is we take to the highest level, whatever we think is the highest enlightenment purpose, we turn that into God as compared to what God actually says. And then he says in the end, God by any other name, we are worshiping animals and we see that, right? You know, Moses goes up and he gets the Ten Commandments. And how long was he up there? 40 days? And he comes down and they're already worshiping calves. We turn everything into a item of worship. Money, success, power. It doesn't even have to be in these standard God forms like we used to have where you Zeus and Artemis for fertility and Athena for wisdom. We didn't even have to do that anymore. We've gone right to the thing, and we call anything that we devote our lives to, whatever is first in our life, that's what we worship. And all of that, he says, is distorted and misdirected. So we're going to talk next week about what God is and constructive ways of looking at God. So my challenge to you is think about some ways that you look at God. Is it because of the kinds of parents you had? Is it because you got this image from a church that is telling you that it's some kind of a contract that God will love you if you do X, Y, and Z? Try to think about your relationship with God and how some of these false images of God, and there's more out there too, uh, but are somehow impeding your true relationship with God and the immensity of everything that God contains.
Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, a better life in small steps.com is the home for all of my podcasts. It lists all of them. You can see links to them there. You can also just search for Jill McKinley and you'll find all the podcasts I have. And my friend M writes a blog there. It's meant to really encourage your life, make it better and happier. And you can find that there as well. And remember, our walk to finding the true Jesus in the midst of all this bad messaging starts with small steps. <music>